Peter Ling, noted author and member of an old royal family of China, and Robert Cobb of Hollywood's world-famed Brown Derby. Our conductor, Louis Silvers. This presentation comes to you through the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, direct from the Lux Radio Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, in the hope that your pleasure in listening to Madame Butterfly equals their pleasure in bringing it to you. Welcome, everyone. Have you ever wondered, as you take a cake of Lux Toilet Soap from its wrapper, how can they sell a soap like this for so little? Well, it's true that Lux Toilet Soap is an amazing value. Will you check off some facts with me? It is made just as the costliest French soaps are made and of the very finest ingredients. It is mild, pure, snow white. It is delicately fragrant with an exclusive, expensive perfume. It has the special advantage of active lather that prevents choked pores, guards against cosmetic skin. It is only possible to sell a beauty soap like this at a modest price because so many of you, literally millions of you, use it and keep on using it. And surely it is significant that nine out of ten lovely screen stars who can afford to pay any price use inexpensive Lux toilet soap to guard their million-dollar complexions. And now, our producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With the vigilance of an eagle guarding its young, the late David Belasco cherished his reputation as a producer of nothing but successful plays. Yet the time came when Mr. Belasco sponsored a production that the public did not like. It was called Naughty Anthony and failed despite the talents of Blanche Bates and Frank Worthing. Mr. Belasco was equal to the occasion. He wrote a one-act play from a story by John Luther Long called Madame Butterfly, presenting it as an extra offering immediately after the last act of Naughty Anthony. With Blanche Bates as Butterfly, the play was a sensation. Yet at 8.30... The theater was consistently empty. It wasn't until after 10 o'clock each night that the ermined elegance of New York society stepped from their carriages and crowded the theater. One of the 10 o'clock scholars was an Italian composer named Giacomo Antonio Domenico Michele Secondo Maria Puccini. He saw the play, conferred with Velasco, and wrote his immortal opera, Madame Butterfly. In our story tonight, we borrow from both play and opera. Since the opening of Columbia's new film, When You're in Love, Hollywood is hailing Grace Moore and Cary Grant as the most important team of the new year. Miss Moore has reached a fame in grand opera, motion pictures, radio, and on the concert stage that comes only to the truly great. In her first starring picture, One Night of Love, she sang the arias from Madame Butterfly, thereby introducing grand opera to talking pictures. We welcome her tonight as the little geisha girl, Cho Cho San. Our Lieutenant Pinkerton is Carrie Grant. Born in England, Carrie ran away from school when 13 to become an acrobat. A month passed before his father caught up with him. But three years later, Carrie was back with his old troupe. He came to New York first as a comedian, later as a singer in operettas. Thence to Hollywood, where 23 pictures have elevated him to well-earned stardom. Pedro de Cordoba, with whom I acted 35 years ago in E.H. Southern's company, will be heard as the Bonza. Merrick Windheim fills the role of Goro, the same part he sang in the Metropolitan Opera House many times. The moment has come when footlights blaze forth. The musicians await the command of a raised baton, and the Lux Radio Theater presents Grace Moore and Cary Grant in Madame Butterfly with Pedro de Cordoba and Merrick Windheim. Our scene is the inner garden of a Japanese tea house in Nagasaki. At bamboo tables along the wall, wealthy Japanese merchants and their friends sit over steaming cups, conversing in gentle tones, applauding the performance of the geisha girls. In a far corner of the garden, two Americans, Lieutenant Pinkerton of the United States Navy and his friend Sharpless of the American Consulate. Pinkerton stirs restlessly in his chair as Sharpless questions him. 
You don't mean this, Pinkerton. You're not really serious. <laughs> Why not? Oh, but a geisha girl, it's... Well, it's not being done, that's all. You know, Sharpless, you're approved. This is Japan, not Hackensack. Exactly. And American naval officers don't go around marrying geisha girls. Well, this one's going to. She'll have me. Supposing she is a geisha girl. She's as fine and decent as they come. Say, if I married an American cabaret singer, you wouldn't turn gray over it. If she's an American girl, I'd say go to it. But these girls are different. Now, what's going to happen to her when you go back to the States? You can't take her with you, Pinkerton. I've already told you, Sharpless. I'm in love with the girl. You love her enough to spend the rest of your life with her? What do you mean? Well, you wouldn't have to. I suppose you know that. Hmm, I've heard something about it. Yes. The Japanese law is convenient for foreigners. You can take a wife for 999 years, but you can annul the marriage any time you want merely by walking out on her. Now, wait a minute. If you're suggesting... I'm not suggesting anything. I'm stating facts. Well, it happens that I know the facts. It also happens that I love this girl. I'm going to marry her, regardless of what you think about it. Well, it's your life, Pinkerton. You can do what you want with it. Oh, forget it. Come on, Sharpless. Snap out of it. Which girl is it? She's here at this tea house. Her name's Jojo San. The one they call Butterfly? Yes, you know her? Oh, I've seen her. She's a pretty little thing. So young. <laughs> She's like a child sometimes. You know, I've never met a girl like her before. And I never will again. She's deep down inside of me and I can't get her out. You see, I, uh, I've got it pretty bad. Lieutenant Pinkerton? Yes, Goro? Chocho san says she waits your pleasure. Where do Lieutenant wish to sit with Chocho san? Oh, in the outer garden by the fountain. Hello, I'll see you there in a few minutes. Chocho san, be there. Thanks. You'll excuse me, Sharpless? Oh, Pinkerton. Uh huh. Yeah? There's nothing I can say? No, I'm afraid not. See you later, old man. All right. Butterfly. Oh, Lieutenant B.F. Pickerton. <laughs> You're glad to see me? Always so glad to see you. You bring me something today, a present, Lieutenant B.F. Pickerton? <laughs> no, not today, Butterfly. Oh, it is no matter. Well, I'm sorry I forgot. You like me to bring things for you, don't you? Yes, but not for gift. Only that I may show you how happy it makes me that you think of me. <laughs> Let's sit down, shall we? We must not stay long. Soon I must go to Inner Garden to sing there. Oh, they can wait. You're much more important to me right now. Oh, Lieutenant B.F. Pickerton, how nice things you say. But I am Geisha girl, and Geisha girl must sing. Mm -hmm. Tell me, do you like this life, Butterfly? Like? It is so hard to tell. It is the only life that ever I have known. Once, long, long ago, when I was such a little girl, I live at American Mission. Mm -hmm. I remember there how quiet it was, how happy the life. They teach me there to sing, to play, to speak as you. American language. <laughs> oh, I remember such a small part of that life. It was so long ago. Mm -hmm. How did it happen that you lived at a mission? My mother, she died. Then my father. I was alone. They take me to mission to live there. But one day came my uncle to the mission and take me away. Mm. My uncle, he is priest, a bonzo. A priest? A priest of Japan. He take me from mission and bring me here to sing as geisha girl. You mean he... he sold you? He is a priest and very old. His wish must be done. Butterfly, look at me. What would your uncle do if you left this place? Leave the tea house? Oh, that cannot be. A geisha girl must stay until some rich merchant buy her for his wife. Mm -hmm. And there are no rich merchants? None that I like. <laughs> they are not kind in their hearts like you, Lieutenant B.F. Pinkerton. Butterfly, I did bring something for you today. You bring your present? Yeah. Here you are. See? Oh, a ring. But this is not for me. <laughs> Why not? It is too beautiful, too precious. Those jewels. Oh, it cannot be for me. Darling, listen. In America, 
When a girl puts this ring on her finger, it means she'll marry the man who gave it to her. But I am not American girl. I know, but I love you, Butterfly. I've loved you since the first day I saw you in this garden. You want to marry me, Chocho San? <laughs> Is it so surprising? <laughs> oh, one night I have a dream. A man in the white of an officer come to me. In a garden where the cherry blossoms fall. He leans so close to me. Until my eyes can see but him. Until he is the whole world to my eyes. And then he whispered to me, telling me of his love. Now, that dream is here, but it frightens me. For fear it may still be a dream. <laughs> Lieutenant Pinkerton? Has, uh, has everyone gone? Wedding party all gone. Eat many cakes, drink much wine. <laughs> well, they're welcome to us. Hey, Japanese girls have a lot of relatives, haven't they, Suzuki? When girls marry rich American, always many relatives to help feed. <laughs> Suzuki, outside. Call if you want. All right. Lieutenant B.F. Pinkerton? Come in, Butterfly. They have gone. Every single one. Oh, I have think they stay forever. Why, were you so anxious to be alone? I am your wife now. <laughs> Come here, Butterfly. Let me look at you. Has anyone ever told you you were very, very pretty? Some. Before this, I have never believed it. But now I am happy to be pretty. Or you. Oh, and you are, darling. You know what I do yesterday, my husband? I go to Christian Mission House. Mm -hmm. For what? I have taken a new religion. What do you mean? Your religion. You shouldn't have done that, dear. You were not angry. Oh, you shouldn't have done it. It is my love that make me. In so many ways must I be worthy of you. Yes, I know, Butterfly, but your family, if they knew about it, your friends... They would hate me. I do not care. For you, I can forget my race, my people. If only you tell me that you love me. Madame Butterfly. Yes, Suzuki? We have forgot your bundle from the tea house. Where shall I put it? Oh, here, Suzuki. I will open it. Suzuki, you have clothes screened? In every room. It rained very hard, Madame Butterfly. Oh, it is no matter. We are dry and warm in our new house. It is not good that it rain on the day of a marriage. It is not good. Well, 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 there's a cheerful soul for you. Yeah, what have you got in that bundle, Butterfly? You wish, see? <laughs> Some few things I have for many years. See? Hmm. What's that thing there? Looks like a small sword. That I hold most sacred. It was my father's. It is written here something, here on the sword. Yeah. To die with honor when one can no longer live with honor. What does that mean? My father was a soldier. He was defeated in a great battle. This sword was sent to him from the Mikado. And your father? He was obedient. You mean, you mean he killed himself? To die with honor when one can no longer live with honor. It is the unwritten law of Japan. Well, well who's the, who the deuce is that? Some of our guests return. Surely not at this hour. Oh, your excellency. Where? Enter. His bandies. It is my uncle, the Bonzo. What does he want? George, her son. Your excellency. Good evening. A thousand pardons. But my business is not with you. Niece, come here. Welcome to our house, uncle. You will have tea. Suzuki, bring tea. I want no tea. I've come to speak with you. To speak with you alone. Uncle. Wait a minute. If you've got anything to say to my wife, you can say it before me and not at all. Church Sam, today in the morning, you go to the house of the Christian mission. That is so? 
Yes, Uncle. Uh, it is so. Why did you go there? Why? Uncle, to I... To swear uh... an allegiance to the Christian God. To renounce the religion of your forebears. To bring disgrace upon your family before the Son of Heaven. No. This, I say, is true. I am American wife now. My belief is as my husband. You have renounced your true religion. For this, then, may the skies rain curses on your head. Be quiet. May your soul perish in everlasting torment. May your friends and family turn from you with loathing, and your children swivel at their birth. Get this out. I Get out. This, I is my curse upon you. As you have renounced your God, so may he renounce you. Malafi. Malafi. You... You hear what he say? Yes, dear. Try not to think about it. Come here, darling. Hold me close, please. So very close, Lieutenant B. F. Pinkerton. I am afraid. <laughs> Now, for a moment, let's listen in at the lobby of the Hotel Roosevelt here in Hollywood. At this time of day, it's quieter than usual. But a handful of people have dropped in from a hard day at a nearby movie studio, from a shopping trip, from sightseeing. As usual, there's a celebrity or two. Look, Tom, isn't that Olivia de Havilland over there? Yes, it sure is. Well, Betty, now you've actually seen a real live screen star. What do you think of her? I think she's perfectly lovely. I adore the color of her hair and eyes. And her skin is gorgeous. After I've shown you one of the big studios and you see the lights they work under, Betty, you'll know why a screen star can't face the camera without absolutely flawless skin. Why, silly, I know that. For simply ages, I've been using the soap screen stars recommend for my own skin. Lux Toilet Soap. Betty's a smart girl. She guards against unattractive cosmetic skin, tiny blemishes, enlarged pores, dullness, by following a simple rule that will bring results for you. Here it is. Before you put on fresh makeup, always before you go to bed, use Lux Toilet Soap. Mr. DeMille carries on. We continue with Madame Butterfly, starring Grace Moore and Cary Grant. Almost a year has passed, and despite the curse of the Japanese priest, Butterfly's life with a naval officer has been one of intense happiness. But now comes the long-awaited summons. Lieutenant Pinkerton has been called back to America. In Sharpless' office at the consulate, the two Americans face each other. Sharpless is reading the naval dispatch order. And together with the destroyer president and the battleship Connecticut to leave the harbor at Nagasaki on the afternoon of April the 3rd at 5 o'clock and to set course for San Diego Naval Station. Further orders will be radioed en route. Well, I guess that's that. April 3rd, that... That's tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. Yes, I did what I could, Pinkerton. It wasn't very much use. They want you back there. What are you going to do about Butterfly? I... I don't know. This sort of hits me right between the eyes coming out of a clear sky like this. I can't think. I told you once before you couldn't take her with you. I know, I know. You knew you'd have to face this sometime, didn't you? Maybe. I didn't think much about the future. That makes it twice as hard to think about it now. You'll tell her, of course. Of course. When? Oh, tonight, I guess. I'll put it off as long as I can. I have to make her understand that I'm coming back. Are you? How do you know? I'll get back all right. Now, look here, Pinkerton. I'm going to talk to you like an uncle. If I tread on your toes, yell out. Well? Weren't you engaged once back in the States? No. To Catherine Ford? I told you no. That was just a kid affair. We grew up together. Your family's rather counted on your getting married, didn't they? Still count on it. <laughs> what about it? It takes more than families to make a wedding. Well, I was just thinking. If you wanted to marry Catherine, you could, you know. Thanks. And what happens to Butterfly? Oh, you know the law here. It's like a divorce. A month from now, she'll be free to do as she wants. Or she'll forget you, Pinkerton. Don't you believe it. She can't forget me any more than I can forget her. I wish you could. Oh, I know it sounds heartless and selfish. But it would be a lot better. She'll live the life of the kind of life she should live, 
among her own people. Marry some wealthy merchant. <laughs> a wealthy merchant? Do you think that's going to ease my conscience? Oh, why should you have a conscience? You've given her a year of happiness. She'd never have had this show if it hadn't been for you. And what about the years to come, the sad years? She wouldn't have those either. You can't convince me, Sharpless. It just won't do. No? I'm afraid it may have to do. Butterfly. Oh, I did not hear you come. Go on with your playing, Butterfly. I play only when you are not here to pass away the hours. Now you have come back, I am happy again. You're always happy, aren't you? Always, when you are near me. Butterfly, come here. How would you feel if... if I had to go away? I should be sad. Yes, but if it weren't for long, just a little while. I should be sad, but happy. The hours would seem as days, and the days as years. But never would I tire of waiting. You, uh... You make it very difficult, dear. I don't know what you mean. Well, you see, I... I do have to go away. Oh, no. Yes, Butterfly. They called me back to America. The order came today. When... When must you leave? Tomorrow, dear. We sail at sunset. Tomorrow? At sunset? Yes, dear. Oh, tomorrow. It is so short a time. And I shall miss you so. And yet, it is right. What is right? It has been said that for every moment of happiness, there must be one of pain. I have been too happy with you, much too happy. And now I must know the pain. Oh, you mustn't feel that way, Butterfly. It, it may not be for long. How long? I, I don't know, dear. It is now the time when the robins nest. Do you think that when they nest again, you will come back to me? Yes, Butterfly. When the robins nest again. Oh, it is such a very long time. Try not to think about it, dear. We still have tonight. Yes, tonight. And I shall remember everything you say and everything you do. And I shall store each little thought far back in my mind so that when you are gone, I may take them out one by one and hold them to my heart. Lieutenant Pinkerton reporting, sir. Hmm? Oh, come in, Lieutenant. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Just received an order from the base, Lieutenant. I don't imagine it'll be much of a surprise to you, though. Order, sir? We're putting you ashore for a while, Lieutenant. Ashore? Yes, at San Diego. The report to Commander Wilson there. He'll instruct you in your new duties. But, but I don't understand, sir. You mean I'm not to be with the fleet any longer? Not for a while. Didn't Sharpless tell you? Sharpless? No, sir. Well, you'll assist at the training base. They need a good man, Lieutenant. I recommended you for the post some time ago. Oh. So that's what Sharpless meant. Hmm? How long am I to stay there, sir? A year or two. Possibly three. Three years? I can't do it. What's that? I can't. This is not a request, Lieutenant. It's an order. I know, sir, but uh, I'd rather resign. You than... can't resign in the face of an order, Lieutenant Pinkerton. We don't ask men what they'd like to do in the Navy. We tell them to do it. Anything else? No, sir. Nothing, sir. Now, wait a moment, Goro. Now, go back to the beginning and tell me the whole story. Slowly, now. Very good, Excellency. My name, Goro. I am, what you say, marriage broker. Two days past, I go to see Madame Butterfly. Yes, I tell her rich man, Yamadori, wish to marry her. She say, no. She say she's already married to Lieutenant Pickerton. She say she's married to him two years. 
cannot marry Yamadori. I say I go to his excellency, Mr. Sharpless, and ask him. Does she want to marry this Yamadori? Yamadori, very rich merchant. Very good much. Oh, but does she want to marry him? Uh, she will marry. Goro get big commission. Oh. Well, then tell her she's free to do as she wants. She can marry Yamadori tomorrow. Very good, Excellency. Goro, tell her. She'll be very pleased. But, uh, Lieutenant Pickerton, uh, you will tell him, Excellency, that Madame Butterfly is to marry? Yes, I'll tell Pinkerton. He's in America now, but I'll write and tell him today. Suzuki! Suzuki! You call Madame Butterfly? Look, Suzuki, up here in the garden. You see that bird? Mm, I see. You know what this is, Suzuki? It is Robin. Yesterday I see one. Today this is the second. Oh, they have come back. They have come to nest. Suzuki, why do you look at me like that? Twice have the robins come to nest, but still he is not here. But he will be soon. I know, Suzuki. I feel it. Then why do his letters stop coming? First he writes to you one whole year. Then for one whole year, there is no word. I do not know why. If I could write to him, I would ask him why. But there is reason, Suzuki. There must be very good reason. You do better to forget Lieutenant Pinkerton. You do better to marry Yamadori. No. I have told you. I have told Goro. I have told Yamadori. I know can marry. I am Mrs. Lieutenant B.F. Pinkerton. Never will I marry someone else. Never. Oh, he will come back, Suzuki. He will come now. Oh, yes. If he knew about his little son. He will never know he has a son. That is not true. Why you say things like that? Every night I pray to God. Send back her husband to little butterfly. Send back the father of her baby son. Many months have come and go. Yet is there no sign from the gods. Yet is there no answer. There is answer here in my heart. It say, be brave, don't cry too much. For soon he will come back. But yet have I never, never heard of foreign husband who returned to his house. You have no faith, Suzuki. But I have faith. I know. It is like the song I sing to him the day before he leaves. The song of the girl who know her lover will come back. Someday in his heart he will hear my song. And he will come.
Station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNX, the Columbia Station, Los Angeles. Grace Moore, Carrie Grant, and our all star cast return shortly in Madame Butterfly. The scene of our play, Japan was the home for several years of tonight's royal guest, the Princess De Ling, member of the imperial line of Manchus, who ruled China from the middle of the 17th century to 1912. Daughter of the late Lord Yu Keng, eminent Chinese minister of foreign affairs and ambassador to many European nations, Princess De Ling, now a resident of California, is a noted lecturer and author of many books on the Orient. Ladies and gentlemen, Princess De Ling. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Listening to tonight's play brings back memories of a childhood spent in Japan when my father was ambassador in Tokyo. It was there that my tutor taught me the same dances that Madame Butterfly would dance as a geisha girl. There also did I learn the Japanese art of arranging flowers. Each year, blossoms become an occasion for imperial activities in Tokyo. My meeting with the Emperor and Empress of Japan, parents of the present ruler, took place at a cherry blossom garden party. I was greatly impressed by the loveliness of the Japanese women. What beauty care they use, I frankly cannot recall. But I do remember well that the Empress Dowager of China, the Ras of the Manchu ruler, was exceedingly particular about her personal appearance. Are you going to tell us that Lux soap penetrated even to the Forbidden City in Peking? No. The Empress lived in the days before Lux toilet soap. But I use Lux toilet soap, Mr. Daniel, and I am convinced there is nothing better. I was about to enroll in Vassar College when the Empress summoned me to the palace as lady-in-waiting. What are the duties of a lady-in-waiting? I had charge of her jewel room, her blue diamond crown, her pearl cape made of 3,500 pearls as large as canary eggs, were almost as nothing in that room of fabulous wealth. But the real task of a lady-in-waiting was to entertain Her Majesty. And what gave her the most pleasure? Reading, particularly. The Taming of the Shrew, Arabia and Juliet were great favorites. 
There were those who say the old empress had no heart. But when I finished, Romeo and Juliet, she looked at me for a moment and quietly said, it is quite true. Without love, there is no reason for life. With the empress, the sun set on another line of royalty. Since those days, I have lived throughout the world, and I assure you all, there is no other country where being alive can mean so much as in my adopted land, the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Princess Darling. <clears throat> Once more, Madam Butterfly, starring Grace Moore and Cary Grant. Another year has gone by, but Butterfly's faith is still unshaken. With the passing of each day, she's happier, secure in her belief that every hour brings her husband closer. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the American naval officer has been trying to forget his Japanese wife, thinking that she's married the wealthy merchant. He's received new sailing orders, a trip to the Orient, to Nagasaki. It's the night before his departure. An officer's dance is in progress on board his ship. Pinkerton stands at the rail, gazing thoughtfully across the bay. Hello there. Huh? Oh, hello, Catherine. I've been looking all over for you. What are you doing, hiding? <laughs> no. No, I just came out here to think. About me? Hmm? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, look out there. It's beautiful, isn't it? And tomorrow you'll be sailing out across it, into the sun. Yes. I'll bet a beach you to Japan. <laughs> you probably will. <laughs> we'll be stalling around out there for a week or so, battle maneuvers. Oh, I'm so glad I'm going. I had an awful time talking Dad into it. He kept yelling that he couldn't get away. <laughs> Did you get your tickets? Uh-huh. We're sailing day after tomorrow on the Empress. I'll be a native by the time you get there. Would you like me in a Japanese kimono with a comb in my hair? <laughs> sure I would. You know, you know, I never thought I'd be going back again. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I had an idea I'd be on shore for the rest of my life. It, it seems funny now. <laughs> what seems funny? Going back to Japan? Yes, yes, after three years. So much can happen in three years, Catherine. So much has happened. But <laughs> I don't understand you. Oh, it's all right. I guess I don't understand myself. But you're acting so strangely tonight. There's nothing wrong, is there? Nothing you want to tell me? No, no, it's all right. Let's forget it. Oh, wait. It, it has nothing to do with me, has it? The way you feel about me. What makes you ask that? Oh, I don't know. It's just a feeling I have sometimes. You've known me for so long and... Sometimes when you hold me in your arms, there's such a strange look in your eyes. As if you hardly knew I was there. As if you were thinking of someone else. Catherine, I... That isn't true, is it? You do love me. Really love me. Of course, Catherine. Oh, and I love you. So much. Let's be married in Japan, shall we? Madam Butterfly. Yes? His Excellency, Mr. Shopless, he is here. Oh, come in. Enter, Your Excellency. Good afternoon. I am so glad you come. You, your presence, light my house. Thank you. Why did you not come before? <laughs> well, I've been very busy. How have you been? Oh, very nice. You've been happy? Oh, yes. Butterfly, I heard some time ago that you were to be married again to Yamadori. <laughs> That is so funny. Goro, he come to me and say I should marry. But how can that be? I'm already married. Goro, say, when Lieutenant Pinkerton leave you, it is divorce. But I tell him no. To leave a wife is no divorce in the country of my husband. But if uh, Goro was right, Butterfly? Goro is not right. I know. Hmm. Why do you say that? Well, because I, I've had news of Pinkerton. News? How is he? Is he coming back? What does he say? Butterfly, I... I don't know how to tell you this. But if you can still marry Yamadori, I advise you to accept his offer. What? You say I should be Yamadori's wife? Yes, Butterfly. You say that? You, American counsel? When you know that me, I am already married? Oh, but Yamadori was right. Your marriage was under the Japanese law. It's not binding. You mean... I am not Lieutenant B.F. Pickerton's wife? Yes. No, it cannot be. Love, do not forget. And when he hear about his son... What's that? 
You do not know his father, do not know. His son? You have a son? Yes, you see. That is love, Your Excellency. You write him, please, for me, will you? You tell him of his baby. Oh, such a nice baby. With just his face, the same hair, the same blue eyes. He will come back then. He must come back then. You hear that? Listen. Madame Butterfly. Yes? Madame Butterfly. Yes. The boats, the four American boats. They sail into the harbor. The American boats. Your Excellency, the American boat. He is on them. Oh, tell me. Yes, Butterfly. Are you here, Suzuki? Lieutenant V.F. Pinkerton has come back. Quick, Suzuki, my best dress. Best dress? Oh, Your Excellency, your tea I have forgotten. Oh, it's all right. I can't stay anyway. I am so excited. You will see him at the boat? Yes, I may. Then tell him, please, that I am waiting. Ask him, please, to hurry. I'll tell him. Goodbye, Butterfly. Goodbye, Your Excellency. Suzuki! Here is the best dress. Oh, Suzuki, we must hurry. His room, it must be fixed. His slippers, his chair. That I will do. And me. Oh, today I must be pretty, Suzuki, with my best dress and poppies in my hair, like when I was bride. Rest is the best beauty. He not come yet. You sleep. Sleep? <laughs> How can I sleep? Oh, no, Suzuki. We will wait for him. I in my best dress and our son in his finest suit. There we shall sit by the window, as we have so often. And soon he will be here. Soon. Soon. <laughs> Madame Butterfly, you are asleep? Shh. You must not wake the baby. All day have you been sitting by the window, and still he is not here. It is very late. He will come. It must be that he cannot go from the boat. Sailors have rules, Suzuki. Even a wife counts nothing. <laughs> you must not cry, my son. Soon your father will be coming. It is not good that he should see you crying. Go to sleep. Go to sleep, my son. Come in, Sharpless. I wasn't sure you'd be up here, Pinkerton. It's very early. I haven't been to bed. What were you doing? Walking the floor, thinking over what you told me, trying to figure things out. You didn't go to see Butterfly? Oh, how could I? Catherine is here. She's traveled 5,000 miles to be near me. I, I couldn't just walk out on her. I'm sorry, man. If I hadn't been such a fool, but Goro told me she was going to be married. Oh, I don't blame you, Sharpless. I blame myself for believing a letter. I blame myself for thinking <clears> for one <throat> minute that she could have married again. All this time she's been waiting for me, sitting up there in that house. What are you going to do? Catherine will have to know about it sometime. She knows about it now. Well, you told her? Last night, it was the least I could do. I told her everything, the whole story. What did she say? Well, what could she say? She looked at me as if I'd hit her. I couldn't face her after that. 
I came back here. Uh, it's toughest on her, I think. We were to be married here, you know. Yeah, I know. Well, perhaps I shouldn't have said anything, Pinkerton. Well, it might have worked out some way. No, they don't work themselves out, these things. You've got to face them from the start. But how are you going to face it? The only way possible. I love Butterfly. I've never stopped loving her. I'm going back to her. I've got to see her. Tell her I've got to. All night she has been sitting up. She is tired. Oh, please, you don't understand. Suzuki! Suzuki, who is there? Oh. This lady has come. She wants to see you. Me? Are you Madame Butterfly? Yes. What is it, please? You... You don't know me. My name is Catherine Forbes. It's very important, or I wouldn't have come at this hour. It, it's about Lieutenant Pinkerton. Lieutenant Pinkerton? I have waited for him all night. You know where he is? Yes, I do. Then why doesn't he come to me? Why? Because he thought that you were married again. Because he thought you'd forgotten him. Forgot him? Oh, no. He couldn't have think that. But he did. I know he did. How you know? Because he was engaged to me. Engaged? You know what that means. He was going to marry me. Make me his wife. Make you his wife? No. Oh, I love him. That's why I've come to you, to ask you to give him up. I'll take the baby if you wish. I'll bring it up as my own, but please, don't ruin his life. Don't make him come back to you when he wants to come to me. Did, did he tell you that? That he loved you more than me? How could he tell me? He's tied to you now. He thinks he must come back. But you won't ask him to, will you? You won't make him give up everything. His career, his life. He loved me. He loved me once. But did he? Really? He might have thought he did, but it couldn't have been love. No, he looked on you as a child. A plaything. No, no plaything. I am Mrs. Lieutenant B.F. Pinkerton. If I am not that, then I am nothing. But he loves me. Now, please try to understand. Try to understand how much better it will be for him. And try to help him. If you love him, you will help him. Better for him? You do see that, don't you? I don't know. But if it is better, you would see him now? When I go back, yes. Then tell him that I am not unhappy. Tell him I wish for him all that he wants. Thank him, Mr. B.F. Pinkerton, for all the kindness he has shown me when he was here. And tell him that perhaps I marry soon another man, a very rich man. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Butterfly. Suzuki? I am here. You heard what she say, Suzuki. She is right. He do not love me. I am no longer Mrs. Lieutenant B.F. Pinkerton. <laughs> Madam Butterfly. No, do not cry. It is no use to cry. For tears will not bring him back to me again. <laughs> Some short while ago, Suzuki... You say that I should rest. Go away, Suzuki. And I will rest now. I wish to rest. Sleep. Long sleep. And when you see me again, look whether I be not beautiful once more. As a bride. What are you going to do? My father's sword, Suzuki. You will give it to me. No. No. Give it to me, please. It is there on the table. Oh. Now, so that I have no more pain. Goodbye, Suzuki. Go now, please. Oh. To die with honor when one can no longer live with honor. Butterfly! Butterfly! Where are you? Butterfly! What have you done?
done? Well, if I look at me, I've come back to you, dear. It is too late, my darling. Go back to her. She, she loves you. Oh, darling, darling, why did you do it? Why, Butterfly, why? Do not be unhappy for me. It is better this way. Too bad those robins do not nest again. Darling, Butterfly, Butterfly! Done. And Grace Moore and Cary Grant return in a moment to the microphone. Around the corner from the Lux Radio Theater is one of the most widely known restaurants in the world, the Brown Derby. Visitors to Hollywood make it one of their first stops, for it is there that the screen's celebrated stars and executives may be found at any hour, from breakfast through midnight supper time. Tradition has made the Derby a meeting as well as an eating place. Between its walls, many a contract has been signed, and many other writers and composers, famous for works born over a cup of Derby coffee. Robert Cobb, president of the Brown Derby Corporation and husband of Paramount star Gail Patrick, is here tonight with a word about Hollywood's table mannerisms. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Cobb. Thank you very much, Mr. DeMille. But all this finds me a little bit uneasy, ladies and gentlemen, because, you see, the landlord of the Brown Derby happens to be Mr. C.B. DeMille. <laughs> That's all right, Bob. Just relax. The rent's been paid, and there's nothing more I can demand except one of your famous derby salads for tomorrow's lunch. I might suggest, though, that you tell our listeners how the derby originated. The derby was founded by the late Herbert K. Somborn. When his friends tried to discourage him, Mr. Somborn always replied... I could build the kind of a place I have in mind inside of a brown derby and still make it successful. Now, we've told our audience from time to time what the stars wear, how they spend their spare time, what they do culturally, how they... Uh... Keep their complexions? Mm, yes, I seem to have a vague recollection of touching lightly on that subject before. Then before you go on, I might say that you, with Lux Toilet Soap, and I, with a bill of fare, are aiming at the same thing, to deliver the very best. The lounge rooms of the derbies are supplied with Lux soap exclusively for the convenience of the stars. And incidentally, we also use it in our home. Now, let's see. Where were we? I, I just stopped you from serving a Lux soap sandwich. <laughs> so, uh, I suggest you tell us something of the stars' appetites. Well, they vary a great deal. I found the dish of Wallace Berry, for instance, to be nothing more elegant than corned beef hash. <laughs> while uh, Gary Cooper, Cooper is strictly a beef stew man. Marlena Dietrich's pet dish is lobster thermidor. And Clark Gable and Carol Lombard go for T-bone steaks. But Joan Bennett likes dainty dishes. Ann Southern keeps in trim by eating non-fattening vegetables. But when George Raft waltzes in, the chef immediately puts on another hamburger deluxe. <laughs> Stu Irwin and Eddie Sutherland, the director, have a yen for Chinese food. But Joey Brown has no favorites. <laughs> he likes food and plenty of it. <laughs> My wife, Gail Petrie, is also a very good customer of the Brown Derby. As a matter of fact, she thinks the kitchen in our home is a place to store trunks. <laughs> By the way, since I promised to take Gail out to dinner tonight, I'd better say thanks and goodbye, Mr. Uh, where, where are you taking her, Bob? Oh, we thought we might try something different for a change. Probably go to the Derby. <laughs> I hope you've made a reservation. <laughs> the tremendous success of our star's new picture, When You're in Love, is reason enough, I think, to ask them to talk about it. One of the hits of the film is Miss Moore's rendition of Minnie the Moocher. <laughs> Perhaps... <laughs> Perhaps she'll tell us what it's like for an opera star to go Harlem. Ladies and gentlemen, Grace Moore and Cary Grant. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Oddly enough, I found Minnie the Moocher a delightful but very, very difficult aria. 
I must confess that when it came time for me to sing it, I suffered the first attack I've ever had of real stage fright. Mm -hmm. When I was finished, I was certainly ready for the showers. Oh, yeah. We had them, too, Mr. DeMille. For three solid days, we were drenched to the skin making that rain scene in the woods. And neither Grace's double nor mine, Mel Maryhugh, got a drop on them. We really got it all. <laughs> <laughs> that was the longest shower bath I've ever taken. The only thing lacking was a cake of Lux toilet soap. <laughs> soap. <laughs> Whose praises, that's Mr. Right. DeMille, I'm always glad to sing. Now, that's praise on a high scale. <laughs> <laughs> Last spring, on my Scandinavian tour, I found Lux soap wherever I went. <laughs> There was even a big poster with my picture advertising it in every hotel lobby in the towns I sang in. But in spite of the rain in our picture, we had a splendid time, thanks to another great director, Robert Riskin. Sick. You know, Grace, you know, Grace, like Mr. Riskin, is becoming quite a writer. In between scenes, you go to her dressing room and edit her new book. That's news. What's it about? The hmm? Romance of Food. It's a book of recipes. It tells all about the delicious foods I've discovered all over this country and Europe. And I think I'll go to the Derby tonight for dinner. <laughs> There's only one thing more, Miss Moore, to make it a perfect evening for us. And that's another song from you. Oh, uh... <laughs> oh um... What would you like to have me sing, Mr. DeMille? Whatever you'd like to sing, Miss Moore. Well, tonight's program sort of brings back old memories, fond memories. So just for old times, see, I think I'll sing Chitty Bitty Bee. Our deepest thanks. We look forward to having you both with us again in the near future. Next Monday night, the Lux Radio Theatre brings you Marlena Dietrich with Herbert Marshall in Desire. To tell you more is scarcely necessary. Save that our story is that of a jewel thief played by Miss Dietrich with such marked success on the screen. Herbert Marshall returns for his fourth appearance on our stage. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Marlena Dietrich with Herbert Marshall in Desire. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Your announcer has been Melville Ruiz. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.